Good evening, everybody. I'm Nona Baker, co-chair of MPN Voice, and I'm very excited and delighted to welcome you to a new initiative from the uh, MPN Support Group Forum team at Guy's and St. Thomas's, um, and to have this first of six webinars that will happen every other month. Um, and um, it, it's great that we're able to reach out to you in this way, and I'm particularly grateful to the team at Guy's um, for all their help in putting this together. Um, just uh, a little bit of housekeeping. There's still a chance to submit your questions to the panel. Please use the Q&A box to send your questions anytime during the event. Uh, we will do our very best to answer as many as possible. Uh, we can't answer any questions about your personalized treatment plans. Please speak to your own consultant about that. Um, please use the Q&A box for questions you would like our panel to answer, not the chat. And a really useful thing for us, as this is a new initiative, would be for you to fill out the feedback survey, because the more we can uh, know what the patient community want and what they want to hear about, the more we can tailor make the webinars to meet your needs. Now, I know I've said that this is the guys in St. Thomas support team, but what I would encourage you to do is get in touch with your local teams and see if they would like to start a, a support team. Contact Maz and uh, at MP, info at mpnvoice.org.uk and Maz will help liaise with teams that are happy and want to start a local uh, support team. Um, and so the next thing we have is an agenda for you this evening. Um, and the, the team will be welcomed by Claire Woodley, the advanced nurse practitioner. Um, I'm delighted to welcome you, Claire, and we really look forward to listening to what you have to say this evening. Thank you so much for doing this. So hello, everyone. Um, welcome to the first GSTT um, support group of the year. Um, we've been a support group that's been running for about five, six years now. Um, and um, we were meeting three to four times per year. Um, as with a lot of other things during COVID, we were running as a virtual forum last year, meeting every two months. Um, the group was initially set up so that patients could meet with other patients to offer each other support um, for emotional support, um, for sharing experiences. Um, it, the group generally runs with um, an expert speaker for the first 30 minutes and then it's a group discussion between the members that have joined the support group. The, the whole sessions tend to last for an hour and a half. Um, the reason for opening out today's session was really because of some of the feedback that I've had from patients in our clinics and through other means where we've been raising some um, thoughts and feelings around what happens with the changing all the COVID rules and kind of having some additional support to um for to, to develop and, and to move forward in this kind of new environment that we are all moving towards. We have some set dates for the remainder of the year. So if you are a GSTT patient or you're a patient in the southeast of London at our local hospitals, then please do get in touch with us because we can send you details of the future support groups. Um, so firstly, now I'm going to hand over to Professor Claire Harrison, who's going to give our first talk of the night. OK, thank you, Claire. And thanks to all the team for being here with us um, this evening. And welcome to everyone who's online. I can see there's 118 people um, taking part in in the meeting. So that's fantastic. So. I just wanted to give you some update about current information about COVID and new treatments, just to make sure that everyone's really up to date, because as we see patients in the clinic, sometimes um, people we feel people perhaps aren't as up to date as they might be. And I'm frankly not surprised because the government information is really confusing and, um, and the terminology is also very confusing. So 
Um, I'm sure you're probably all sick of seeing graphs and I've actually given up looking at exponential curves. But um, just to really make the point that it's quite clear that we are coming down now in case numbers in England. We've clearly had a big peak of Omicron and our hospital admissions have been less than they were previously. So it's quite clear that if you look at the in the middle of the slide, the peaks that we had last year had far more hospital admissions in proportion to the size of the peak than we've recently had. And that is also true in London, where we are clearly also moving down from a peak. London tends to peak a bit earlier than the rest of the country. And just for some up-to-date kind of local information at Guy's and St Thomas's, we've currently got between 60 and 70 COVID positive inpatients. And that's been quite static for the past month. And um, some of those are people who've come in for other things and just happen to have had a positive swab. Others are patients who are in hospital because of COVID. Um, so that does continue to still put a bit of strain on the hospital. And you will notice if you've been into your local hospital or our hospital that we are still um, suggesting that our patients need to wear face masks and our staff do as well. Our staff are all swabbing twice a week, wearing face masks and are still isolating if they have COVID. So we are still taking full precautions in hospital to protect our patients. And we are also, the healthcare teams are also continuing to work at more stretch than we normally would. So from what I've shown you, I just want to move on to talk about vaccination. And so it's quite clear that some of the differences in hospitalisation rates, et cetera, really do relate to vaccinations. And but they also relate to behaviour and wearing a mask and being cautious, et cetera. Um, so I, the first point I really would like you to take home today is that all patients with MPN, if fully vaccinated at this point, will have had or are about to have four doses of vaccine. So there was a lot of confusion about booster doses and extra boosters for patients whose immunity is compromised. So we are suggesting that MPN patients have had their, what's their third dose would have been called a third primary, and then they have a fourth dose of vaccine. Generally, that is a Pfizer vaccine, but it's also OK if it's a Moderna vaccine. If you need help getting that, speak to your GP or your hospital team and we will send out uh, information that will help you to book in. Recently, our local data and data from the team in Oxford and internationally is showing that um, patients who may not have made antibodies to their first and second doses of vaccine have done so to the third dose. And we're about to look at patients who've had a fourth dose. And it's also important to say, even if you don't have antibodies, you may have those all, all important T cells. So don't get too hung up on antibody levels. Um, there is a temptation to go and get that them checked, but they don't always predict your um, immunity. Clearly, the virus is still circulating, so it can't be completely forgotten. And so inevitably, you know, some of us are going to catch the virus. Personally, I had it myself in February and spent a day in bed, but still managed to do some work. Um, but now I want to move on and talk to you about new therapies that are available for patients who are so-called at risk, including um, our patients with MPN. So we think this is really important and we think there is not enough awareness of this. So I wanted to talk to you about it. So we have the ability now to do a preemptive treatment for COVID. It's a bit like if you had a bad chest infection, you would contact your GP and get antibiotics. So now we have these treatments, which um, would be for pre-hospital, maybe when you've just got a stuffy nose, and they are delivered via so-called COVID medicines delivery units. There's a network of 50 or more of these units that are set up across England. If you are dialing into this seminar and you don't live in England, if you have a look at the MPN Voice website, it talks about 
these kind of facilities and structures in Scotland and Ireland and Wales. I'm just going to talk about England because this is really a local support group, but the information is on the website. These are mostly hospital based. Who is eligible for these kind of uh, treatment centres? So all patients with an MPN who are taking a treatment to control their blood counts. So that would mean that if you're an ET or a PV patient just taking aspirin, you wouldn't be eligible because aspirin doesn't suppress your immunity as such. The current guidelines also state that all patients with myelofibrosis, regardless of whether they're taking a treatment or not, are eligible. So important to bear that in mind. So how would you get access to one of these um, units? And what are the medicines? Well, don't get too hung up on uh, what these medicines are. As the cartoon says, you may well need a specialist to pronounce them. But there are a number of different um, treatments and um, all of them are, have been shown to be effective at reducing the risk of severe disease and hospitalization. But I'm gonna to talk to you about a few of them that are currently available. These are all licensed therapies. So the first group of type of treatments includes a drug called citrovimab, and um, this is basically manufactured antibodies manufactured in the lab against the spike protein, which is the protein that is needed and used by the virus, as you can see in the little diagram, to enter the cells. So um, this has been used uh, in the past. It is not, it doesn't suppress your immunity. It's not made from people's um, blood. It's manufactured in a lab. Um, it targets the virus, not the host, and it can be given with other medications. So there is no contraindication for an MPN patient to have these. And just at the bottom, I'm actually showing you um, a lateral flow test for a patient who had a positive lateral flow in the morning, and then the middle lateral flow test is negative. That was two hours after the citrovimab infusion, and the one on the right is a day later. So this is given in a hospital, and you will be brought to the hospital, or um, if you're able to drive or someone can drive you, you can also be driven. The other class of drugs that we are giving through these uh, units are so-called antivirals. These stop the virus um, dividing, and there are several of them, three different ones actually. So remdesivir, um, that's something that's been around for quite a while in the pandemic. That has to be given as a drip, and it's given over several days. So it's unusual to give this outside of the hospital. It is given to hospital inpatients. And then there is uh, Nermatrelevir and Ritonavir, better known as Paxlovid, or as somebody said the other day, Paxcovid. Good way to remember it. And this basically chops, uh, stops the virus from producing proteins. And then there's another drug called Molnupiravir, which um, means that it induces mutations in the virus that stops it being able to divide. So both... Paxlovid and Molnupiravir are available as tablets and would generally be delivered to you at home from the COVID medicines unit. So this is Paxlovid, which is a combination of different tablets. It's taken twice a day for five days. And there's a little cartoon on the right showing that it stops the virus from chopping up the proteins, which are those little colored beads at the bottom of the slide into separate bits. And if you want to know a bit more about how these work, there's a link on the slide, um, which takes you to a website. Um, so there's just a little bit more detail on there. The thing about this medicine and the reason that MPN Voice has said to patients, have your list of medications ready when you're ready to be called by the uh, MD, CMDU unit, and I'll tell you how to do that in a minute, is it interacts with many different medications, importantly, warfarin and ruxolitinib, which are quite common MPN medications. So the team will then often ring your haematology doctor or their local haematology doctor and get advice. 
It might be that you need your INR check more often, or it might be, for example, with the ruxolitinib that we reduce the dose for a few days. Also important to know if your kidney and your liver are functioning normally. So the team will check all of these things. The drug that we were using a lot at the beginning when we opened our unit just before Christmas was molnupiravir, which is a lot simpler to use, but slightly less effective. We can't give it in pregnancy and patients must be over 18. But don't worry too much about the details of these medicines. It's more just to give you just a little bit of a flavor. You don't need to be an expert. The doctor that calls you will advise you. And so uh, I told you that the policies are changing and this is a summary of kind of where we are. So we were able to give some of these medications to inpatients in November. In December, in fact, on the 16th of December, the COVID medicines delivery units opened. At that time, we were able to give molnupiravir, then citrovimab, and now we're allowed to give all four of those medications. This is just some number to give you an idea of number and workload. So this is the guys in St. Thomas's COVID medicines unit. And up until the first week in February, 3,429 patients were referred and 462 were treated. How does it work? So I think one of the most important things is to get those little plastic lateral flow tests and do a test. Um, test yourself regularly twice a week if you feel that's not going to make you too anxious. If it makes you anxious to test, don't test. Just test if you've got symptoms. And remember that even mild or unusual symptoms, for example, increasing fatigue, can be a symptom of COVID. So for me, it was just I had a bit of a sore throat and a stuffy nose. So I did a test, and that's actually the picture of my test on the right of the slide. So you only need to do a lateral flow. Some of you might have had a letter saying do a PCR test. You don't need to do a PCR, just a lateral flow. If your lateral flow is positive, either call 111 or speak to your hospital team who will refer you to the nearest COVID medicines unit, and that unit will call you. It's important that you must be within five days of symptom onset, and five days of a positive test. So when you phone 111, they are not going to know all about ruxolitinib and myelofibrosis and ET and PV. And I know you're all used to that because you often speak to people who look a bit blank when you talk about your condition. So keep it simple when you speak to 111, say, I have a blood cancer and I am taking treatment. All they will want to know is, are you eligible? And then they'll be asking you about the types of treatments that you have. If you are called by a COVID uh, medicines unit and they decide that you're not eligible, maybe because you're not taking a treatment, but you still want to be considered for one of these treatments, I just wanted to let you know that there is a clinical trial. We've been fantastic in the UK at running trials for these uh, for COVID. So. Uh, this is uh, Panoramic, which when I accessed this uh, website at the weekend had recruited 13,300 and something patients. And this is open for patients who've got health conditions and all people who are over 50. So if there are other people in your household who would fall into that category who have COVID, they could be recruited into this trial. Um, and this is assessing some of these agents. At the moment, it's assessing molnupiravir and Paxlovid will be opening soon. So I'm going to stop here and hand over to Georgia. Hopefully you'll have regarded that as a kind of information. Don't, again, don't focus too much on the different treatments because they're changing all the time. And Georgia's gonna be talking about, thinking about how to return to normal as all the restrictions lift. So thank you, Georgia. Um, hi everybody, my name is Georgia. I am a clinical psychologist in the um, haematology health psychology team based here at Guy's Hospital. Um, so very used to seeing um, our patients with MPNs and my understanding today is that there's been a lot of requests to learn about how we can navigate anxiety as things are changing. So we are obviously entering into a very uncertain time that have been um, the lifting of restrictions so hopefully during this presentation, 
Um, we can have a bit of a think about that and hopefully I can pass on some strategies that you might find helpful um, just as you're navigating this period. So I guess the first thing is thinking about the challenges that COVID has brought to, um, to all of our lives. So for lots of people, it's impacted the way that we contact our loved ones. Um, you know, maybe that you haven't been able to see the people that you care about as much as normal. Maybe you've had to contact them in different ways. Maybe it's been over Zoom or FaceTime or just big changes in that regard. Um, changes to jobs. Many of us are working from home. There was furlough. Um, people might have um, lost jobs, unfortunately, or might be working in different ways. Um, there's likely to have been changes to your healthcare. So maybe you're having more appointments with your medical team virtually. Maybe you are um, attending a little bit less frequently. Maybe the telephone clinics, whatever it might be. Um, daily activities have been completely different. You know, it might be that you're not able to do things in the same way. Maybe now you're trying to navigate going back to doing things the way that you were before. Um, and, you know, just moving down the list as well, thinking about having to slow down. Sometimes this has been a real positive for people. Sometimes people are telling me that they've found it really useful to have the opportunity to go about things a bit slower and are maybe a bit apprehensive about the pace increasing again. Um, dealing with uncertainty and, you know, challenges and ensuring that your basic needs were met. You know, going back to the beginning of this, thinking about the, the toilet roll issue that people had um, in this country, trying to find enough food. It's certainly been a lot of challenges that we've all had to, to navigate. Um, and these have had big impacts, you know, for a lot of people, people have been feeling very lonely. There's been a lot of fear and anxiety. That uncertainty is, is a very difficult thing to sit with, isn't it? Not knowing quite what um, is around the corner, not knowing whether or not you or your loved ones will, will be on well and what that will look like. There's been a lot of anger and frustration, you know, confusion around the, um, the policies and the information that we've been given by the government and other people who uh, have been passing on COVID information. It might be that you've been feeling trapped. I mean, being stuck at home was very tough for a lot of people, um, trying to find different ways of going about things, feeling very overwhelmed and hopeless. Um, it might be that some people have felt a sense of relief and that's okay as well. Um, but certainly as we're navigating this, this time, some of these things will be coming up for you again. So after the last couple of years, how can we start returning to normal? How can we start navigating um, the changes to restrictions? Um, I think for a lot of people, you do get used to it weirdly, you know, as bizarre as the last couple of years have been, it does become a new normal and coming back to the way things were before can be quite stressful. So, um, the first thing I would say is whatever you're feeling is completely normal. It is completely normal to feel really anxious and scared about these changes. It's normal to feel frustrated and confused about why restrictions are lifting. Maybe, you know, talking about what Claire's been saying, we know that the COVID, that COVID hasn't gone, but just navigating that uncertainty. It might be that you're feeling quite excited. Maybe you're excited for things to get a bit back to normal. And, and that's okay too. You know, we're in the middle of this pandemic you're not so you're not going to feel okay all the time you're human and i think there is a huge amount of uncertainty and when our brains are faced with uncertainty it will respond with anxiety um so what i would kind of recommend one of the things that can be really useful with this is try and notice and name what you're feeling so trying to ignore or suppress our emotions unfortunately um, often doesn't help. You know, these things are really distressing. Sometimes you might be having quite overwhelming or difficult feelings and you might want to make that go away, but trying to bottle it up, push it down, generally means it builds up and can overspill. Um, so what I would suggest is try and recognize what you're feeling, try and acknowledge that um, and try and be a bit empathetic and compassionate to yourself about the fact that this is difficult but just letting yourself sit with it rather than trying to push it down. Um, because as I kind of demonstrated in this slide, this is something that you might be familiar with. Psychologists often talk about, we call it the stress bucket. So essentially we all have our own bucket or capacity to hold stress. So at any given moment, there is a large amount of stress that you'll be navigating at any given time. So 
even taking COVID completely out of the picture, there's always going to be factors in there like finance, food, safety, family, um, health, all of those things are already there. So when we start adding on additional stresses, what happens is you reach your threshold, your bucket starts to overflow, maybe it starts to crack. And actually that's when we start to notice some, some difficulties. So what we're trying to do is get you to either drill a couple of holes in the bottom of that bucket, maybe add a tap, um, just some ways of trying to ease some of that stress, let some of this stuff out. Um, and hopefully we can go into, in the rest of the slides, I can talk to you a little bit about some ways of turning on that tap or getting a couple of holes in, in, in your bucket to allow yourself to process and release some of this stress at any given moment. So, and yeah, to try and drain it, I think is um, something that we're all looking to do at the moment. So the first thing I suggest really is try and focus only on what is in your control. So anxiety, its nature is trying to make you control the things that are uncontrollable. Um, it's completely normal and human nature to want to have control and certainty in life. But unfortunately, there's so many things that are completely out of our control. Um, and lots of those things come up around COVID. So when we try and get into the habit of controlling things um, that we're not able to, it can often bring additional frustration, additional suffering, um, and ultimately means you're using a lot of energy that could be used in a more helpful way. So what I would say is really look at what you can do and the choices that are available to you and see if you can focus your energy on those things. So a, a metaphor we often use is about being in a tug of war. You know, it's almost like you're pulling as hard as you can on this rope, desperately trying not to go into that precipice. And on the other side of this rope is this really awful monster. It's all of the things you're struggling with. It's your pain, it's anxiety, it's depression, it's low mood. It's all of these really difficult things and you're pulling as hard as you can. And all of your effort is going into that. And often, you know, when people come to, to see medical teams and they come to see um, people like me, um, often you're hoping that we'll get on the rope with you and that we'll help you pull. Um, unfortunately, we're not able to do that. So in this situation, we ask you what other options you're faced with. And sometimes that might be dropping the rope. So it doesn't mean that all of this stuff is gone. You know, it's still there. It's still really difficult. It's still really anxiety provoking. But suddenly your relationship with it is very, dif very different. Um, it frees you up to engage with more of the things that are important to you. Um, and it just helps you approach these situations differently. So with that in mind, how can we drop the rope? What things might be in your control? It might be that the things that you can control are what you do. So maybe it's where you feel comfortable going, maybe wearing a mask. It might be controlling um, who it is you see, what context you see them in. Um, but there's lots of things that are out of your control. And that might be things like what other people are doing. Um, you can't control the government policy. Um, we can't control ultimately whether or not you get it. We can do things to try and minimize the risk, but um, there's always going to be a level of risk in everything that we do. The second thing is about staying in the present moment. So often difficult emotions come with difficult thoughts like anxiety, like worry. Um, and you'll often find that in any given moment, you're either tangled up in all of the things that have happened. Maybe you're spending a lot of time ruminating over the last couple of years and the things that have been difficult, the things that have been taken from you, the opportunities you've missed out on. Maybe you're spending a lot of time focusing on the things that might happen. What if this happens? What if that happens? Worry about how um, COVID is going to progress. What we would really suggest there is just trying to bring yourself back to the present moment and back to the first point, the present moment is the only thing we ever have any control over. Um, and whilst you might want to try and try and plan, sometimes we think, oh, well, if, if I think about every possible eventuality, maybe I'll be more prepared. Often the reality is a little different. Sometimes it means that you can just suffer in the moment and then suffer if it does eventually happen. So try and focus on what's going on for you right now. And that allows you to focus on the things that you can do to help. Um, often we talk about being in the present moment, like all of the thoughts that are whizzing through your mind are kind of like passing cars and you're sort of sitting on the side of the road and letting them come and go. 
when we get tangled in these thoughts, it's almost like running into the road, jumping on, on one of those cars and doing everything we can to try and change it. So one way we can really try and access the present moment is via our breath. You might have heard people talk about breathing exercises quite a lot, but it's because it plays a really important role in our, in our experiences. So our thoughts and feelings are often really closely linked with our physical sensations. So you might notice that at times when you are feeling more anxious, maybe you're worried about something that might happen, you might notice that you do start to feel your heart beat a bit quicker. Maybe you start to notice that you feel quite hot or you have a cold sweat, maybe you feel a bit dizzy. And that can often lead into a bit of a cycle. So these physical sensations can often increase the number of thoughts and increase that feeling of anxiety, which ultimately goes on to make your heart beat even faster and for you to feel even more anxious. One way of breaking out of this cycle can be to try and notice and control the pace of our breathing. So if we can try and get our breath to a more um, consistent rhythm, that can send a message to our bodies that we're safe, that we're not in danger, and slowly you might start to notice that the physical um, and emotional experience can start to change. So on this slide, I've just got um, a brief example of a breathing exercise. Um, there's lots of different ways that you can do this. It's really about finding what works for you. Um, there's lots of different resources available on YouTube or via apps like Headspace, Calm, Balance, whatever it is that you, you find useful. But this example is about trying to regulate the speed of your breath and try and make sure that you're breathing at a consistent number of breaths per minute, which we know can tap into our nervous system and just calm everything down. So this example would mean sitting upright. It can often be helpful to place a hand on our diaphragm, which is sort of sitting underneath your, your lungs. You can't see on me, but um, just underneath your lungs and taking a breath in through your nose for four seconds, holding it for four seconds, and exhaling out of your mouth for six seconds. And just try that for a few minutes and you'll start to hopefully notice that those feelings of anxiety reduce. Um, but this, the numbers, don't worry too much about them. It's about what works for you. Um, I would recommend trying this in a moment when you're not feeling particularly anxious as it might give you a bit of a better idea about what um, speed of breathing would work for you. For some people, um, it might feel that the holding it for four seconds is too long or the breathing out is too long. So to see what works for you. And then in a moment when you are feeling more anxious, you might feel better equipped to manage it. And there's a link there on the bottom um, to give you an example of a breathing exercise. But again, there's loads of resources out there if you just sort of type it into Google. What I really want you to think about as well is trying to do things that matter to you. So the last couple of years, um, things have been very different for everybody. It might be that you've been adapting the things that, that matter to you and you've been doing them in a different way. And it might be that you're trying to consider how to go back to the way you did it before. But spend a bit of time maybe writing it down in a journal, maybe chatting to somebody close to you about what brings you pleasure, joy, calm and gives you a sense of fulfillment. This can give you an idea about what it is you want to be doing more of um, and how we can start to engage in these areas to make you feel like you're living a more fulfilled life. And the other thing is thinking about how we go about this. So I often talk about breaking activities down onto a scale of zero to 10. So it might be that 10 is exactly what you used to do. Maybe that's um, you know spending, going to a football match, getting the train, loads of walking, sitting in a football match around loads of people. Maybe that feels completely out of, out of the question at the moment. So maybe at the moment you're kind of at zero, you're not doing that. But there's loads of steps between nothing and what you used to do that we can start to engage in that might feel more accessible to you. So think about what the different steps on that, on that ladder might be. So it might be that five is saying, well, I really like watching the football. I really enjoyed um, spending that time with my friends, that camaraderie, that sort of um, excitement. So maybe it might be that you decide to go and watch it in a pub with some friends instead. So rather than avoiding activity completely, it might be that there's another step on that ladder that feels more manageable for you, that is still in line with what matters to you and still means that you're doing more of what you'd like to. And again, recognizing that it's really daunting to, to do things again for the first time in a while. 
So allow yourself to ease back into things gradually and expect anxiety. Anxiety is likely to come up during these, um, these next few months and try and use some of these skills that we've talked about and some of the ones I'll go on to, to try to manage it. Um, and also the thing with anxiety is the more um, we avoid things, the more anxious they make us. So actually, if we can try and start to do things more, you might notice that the level of anxiety you experience reduces the more that you do them. Um, the other important thing is about making decisions that feel right for you. So um, speaking to the people involved in your care, using the information that Claire's just shared, and familiarise yourself with the advice for your condition and your circumstances. So, you know, as Claire just talked about in terms of medications and your specific diagnosis and spend a bit of time when you're faced with a decision, weighing up the benefits and risks. So it might be that you, it's useful to write them down as a pros and cons, um, maybe score those and add the numbers up at the bottom. That can be a really helpful way of making a decision. But it's also really important to acknowledge that nothing is certain. So every decision that you make, everything we do, there is a degree of risk in. Um, so seeing if we can acknowledge that, speak to those around us, use the resources that you have around you and think about what precautions you could take that might make that feel more comfortable for you. Um, distraction might feel a bit counterintuitive given what I was saying about sitting with and noticing our thoughts and feelings. But distraction in this situation is slightly different in that we all need a bit of respite. You know, thinking about this stuff 100% of the time is exhausting and it is really tiring. So if you can factor in your day just some time where you can have a break from some of this stuff and try and take your mind off all of the stress and anxiety that the last couple of years have given us, that can be really useful. Um, thinking about whatever that might mean for you to so focus your mind fully on what activities you decide to do. It might be about immersing yourself in a film, in a book, seeing a couple of friends. It might be just something that takes your mind off the stress and anxiety that you're experiencing at the moment. Um, also in these situations, if you do notice your mind wandering to the past or the future, just try and refocus it on what you're doing. It's completely normal for your mind to wander. That's human nature. But again, just really trying to immerse yourself on the task at hand, whatever that might be. Another thing I want you to take away from this is whenever you're noticing that you're feeling quite anxious or there's a thought coming up for you, I want you to ask yourself whether that thought is helpful or unhelpful. So often people come to me and get caught up with, oh, well, it's true, this is, this, this is likely to happen. It's true, I need to think about it. And I'll often say, well, is it helpful or unhelpful? And by that, what I mean is, does it take you closer to or further away from the person that you want to be? So often if you might, you might find yourself thinking, oh, what if I go to this place and this happens and I catch COVID or X, Y, and Z? Ask yourself, is that helpful or unhelpful? And if you label it as unhelpful, then maybe see if there's anything that you can refocus on that might take you even a tiny, tiny step closer to the person that you want to be. So a helpful way of, of picturing this is, um, I often, there's a model called the choice point, which I'm hoping will come up now. Oh, there we go. I knew it would go a bit quickly. <laughs> um, so towards is towards the life you want to live, the person that you want to be and away is away from it. So in any given moment, just try and think about what could I be doing that might help me step even a little bit closer towards that life I want. And remembering earlier that it might look a little bit different to what you were doing before, maybe thinking about how you can take even one tiny step on that ladder towards doing something that does bring you joy and does make you happy. So um, that's all of the kind of advice from me mainly. Um, I hope that has all made sense and will hopefully help you add a couple of holes to drain that stress bucket that I talked about earlier. But what I also want to think about is, is there anything helpful that you can take forward from the last two years? So just take a moment to reflect on, on some of these questions. You know, is there anything that you started doing during the pandemic that you'd like to continue with? You know, maybe you have been doing things differently. Maybe you've picked up new skills or hobbies. Can we take those forward? Um, did the pandemic help you to realise the things that are most important to you? Did it help you realise what it was that you missed the most? Um, was there anything that you learned about yourself? 
And also what things helped you through it. You know, it's really important to recognize that you have come through an incredibly difficult time, recognize the resources that you've drawn on, recognize the strength that you've demonstrated and even getting to this point. Um, and what I'm not, uh, what I hope comes across is in this, I'm not trying to um, say that the, you know, the pandemic was a positive thing by any stretch. It obviously was a very difficult um, and traumatic time for many, but do just see if there is anything positive that you can draw on um, and anything that might help you as we move, move out of this into, into a new, new part of the COVID journey. Um, so I would like to ask, ask if there's any questions at this point. Um, but I know we're going on to a question and question and answer session as well. Um, so maybe if you do have any questions, we can you can just direct them to me in a minute. But I've also to my slides attached some resources. So there's a couple of relaxation and meditation tracks, some home workouts if you're not quite ready for the gym, um, some self-soothing exercises, um, and just a couple of other um, resources on the next slide if it does flick for me. Um, yeah, a progressive muscle relaxation exercise, some guided mindfulness meditation. Um, so I hope that's been useful. Um, please do ask any questions if you have them. Um, and I guess we'll move on to the next part. Thank you. Wow, that was amazing, Georgia. <laughs> well, I was going to say thank you very yes. much. Oh. <laughs> for that support. I know I will certainly take away some of the things that you have mentioned in that talk so thank you no um normally in a support group we would open out now and discuss between patients that are attending the support group now we're unable to do that tonight but thank you to those of you that have either submitted live questions or did submit some of the questions beforehand um to us we're going to try and answer some of the questions that have been submitted um so i think um, from one of the pre-submitted um, questions, it was raised about, can we have access to antivirals before um, we actually test positive for COVID? Yes, that would be great, wouldn't it? We could all have our emergency pack of medications. So, I mean, the bottom line answer to that is um, no, not at the moment, but who would have thought in March 2020 that rolling forward, we've all got these little plastic test kits and we mm. can do a test, <clears throat> you know, maybe before we go out and meet people or ask people to do a test before we meet them. So the bottom line answer to that is no, we can't have these medications available. Um, I think, and I think that's actually really sensible because as I was trying to suggest, we sometimes think about different, different ones of these medications in different circumstances. We might have to think about your underlying diagnosis, different drugs. And also, we're so lucky that these new ones of these medications are coming out all the time. So please don't be tempted to buy some on Amazon because they're unlikely to be the right ones. Um, they are becoming more easily available and we are getting clarification on availability. Um, so hopefully that's helped to answer that question. Okay, thank you. Um, there's also been another question about um, information on further booster, va booster vaccines. And I suppose at the moment, we haven't really had any further information on whether um, patients will be asked or whether there will be um, further booster vaccines available for patients at the moment. Yeah, so um, I think what I can tell you at the moment is that we are testing new vaccines that have been engineered to target, for example, the Omicron variant. So currently our current vaccines that are available are still the same as the vaccines we had in uh, Christmas 2020 time. Um, so it may well be that we have got new vaccines that become available. It may be that the situation becomes that a bit like having a flu jab. We might need to have a COVID jab every year for a little while um, but I think we don't really know what's what the situation is going to be I can't imagine that we would be looking at doing any more than four at the moment if we were looking at an additional one 
we're thinking that we might be needing to provide that in the autumn time because we know that these kind of viruses are more common in the autumn time. We do have the ability to make new vaccines and to make them targeted against the virus. So I think that's a really positive thing and something to focus on. Um, Claire, I'm going to ask you a question now. <laughs> and I might ask Georgia as well to think about this one and what, what she would say to somebody if they were asking them. So this is about if you're a patient, you can get your household members vaccinated. But um, recently, and I can see someone has asked this question and it's come up as well in clinic. What about children? And so that is actually quite a difficult question, isn't it? How, what should I think about um, children being vaccinated? So we know that we are vaccinating children age above five if they have um, vulnerability themselves. Um, but there's also the option if you're, for example, a parent or a grandparent living with young children, is it possible to get children in the household vaccinated? So question for Claire and then question for Georgia about maybe how to guide somebody about navigating through thinking about that because it's quite tricky. So Claire? So I think the most in recent information was um, sent out by the NHS that was talking about um, having children of vulnerable patients um, vaccinated and their information did um, say that to wait to be invited for the children to have the vaccines. Um, now at the moment I personally don't have any further information on how they're going to invite um, children of the vulnerable patients to have their vaccines um, but as I say the latest information that I have seen has been around um, you receiving an invite for your children to be vaccinated. Okay, so we've got time to think about it. So, Georgia, is it? I hope it's not too unfair to kind no. of ask you. No, it's not. You no, know, I, I think you know some of us would be a bit worried about Absolutely. taking that risk for children. So, so I think firstly it is about normalising that. Like it is really difficult decision to know whether or not that is the right thing. It's difficult to know um, whether or not you want to get your children vaccinated, and it is ultimately a really personal decision. Um, and I think the advice would be the same for making any of these decisions is knowing that there's risks either way. Um, so taking the time to really sit and think about the pros and cons of the decision, taking time to weigh up um, what it is that's most important to you. And I know it sounds really obvious to do a pros and cons list, but really taking the time to sit and write things out, write everything down, all of your worries um, and rank them from one to five in terms of which is the most important to you. Um, and then at the end, you can score them up and see what that information tells you. Um, and then give yourself a cooling off period. So know that you don't need to make a final decision right now. It might be that you sit down, see what decision com comes to you from that um, process and then give yourself a cooling off period. Maybe say, you know what, I've made that decision. I'll review it in a couple of weeks and see how it's felt. Um, and it might be that if you've said, okay, I'm definitely going to get my children vaccinated, then you spend the next couple of weeks thinking, oh, I really don't think that's a good decision. That gives you information as well. Um, but ultimately, I think it is about knowing that there's not a risk-free option um, and making sure that you have taken the time to, to make that decision so that you know that whatever happens, you made the best decision you could with the information that you had at the time. Um, I know that's a bit of a vague answer, but the reality is it's going to be different for everybody. Um, so that's what I would recommend. I don't think it's a vague answer at all. Yeah. Well. I think it's actually a really helpful answer because yeah. it, it, it is, this is one of those things that is really hard. Absolutely. And I also think that we everyone has had a really pretty tough two years. Definitely. And now we're faced with all of these terrible images of, you know, a awful war in Ukraine and I think everyone is feeling I know mm. I'm feeling it's a bit more difficult for me to make a decision definitely I know Claire's going come on make the decision <laughs> <laughs> but, but it's, it's, it's difficult isn't it and all of those things take our energy as well and actually you might find that loads of your energy is going on um, checking your phone for news updates it might be that you're constantly looking for the latest guidance on vaccination and it can be really draining and it can take a lot of your your energy so just trying to be a bit compassionate to yourself and recognize 
how much we're all carrying at the moment and how much is in your stress bucket um, as well. And really just try and focus on ways of trying to look after yourself and navigate that stress too. Yeah, I love that. I thought that was really great. And there's actually some really positive um, messages in the chat about the stress bucket. So those of you who can have a look. So um, Vicky has said, I love the stress bucket. <laughs> Lots of other people talking about that. Yeah, I think it's quite an easy thing for people to picture, but it does initially sound quite strange when I'm talking about someone's bucket, doesn't it? <laughs> I can go with bucket. Yeah. <laughs> Um, there's probably another question for you, Georgia, on um, how do I get away from wanting my family and friends to do lateral flow tests when I see them in order to feel safe? Yeah, this is something that's come up quite a lot for people. Um, I think the first thing is communication. So giving yourself a chance to really have that open conversation with your family. It can be really difficult at times. And I think sometimes family members, even though you're in the same family, can have very different approaches to COVID and have very different approaches to testing. So I know for some people it can be quite um, a prickly topic, but I would always kind of advocate for just putting your opinion across, saying what it is that would be helpful for you and why that would be helpful. Um, and then that's the only thing you can control. So we, as I mentioned before, we can't control what other people do. We can't control whether or not they test. Um, but I guess you can inform the things that you can control are, can you communicate that to them and see what they say? And also the, ultimately it's in your decision whether or not it feels safe to see them. It might be that you might want to initially start seeing them outside or making sure that you're in a room that's very well ventilated or just certain things that make you feel more comfortable. But unfortunately, as much as I'm sure you'd like to be able to make sure everyone tests before everyone sees each other, um, we can't we can't control what other people do. So it's just about what makes you feel safe and um, what you can control. I think that's really good. And I've certainly had conversations where we've spoken about perhaps starting to meet people yeah. outside and being comfortable with meeting Definitely. friends outside and then looking, as you say, at the Absolutely. environments in which you're meeting people. Is it well ventilated? You know, or is it a small number to begin with perhaps inside and then maybe yeah. move into bigger groups in, in, in bigger areas so I think that's yeah really exactly good. and finding wherever on that ladder feels comfortable for you um, and ultimately knowing that the more you do something the less anx anxious you'll feel over time um, it's the first steps that are really hard isn't it it's navigating that anxiety when when everything has looked very different and all of the advice you've been given for the last couple of years is contradictory to what you've been given now. So it is a very difficult time. Pixie mentions that um, she's used the Calm app. Um, Absolutely, yeah. Which has helped. And, you know, I've certainly also locked into that app mm -hmm. as well, you know, and it has been really helpful Definitely. at times. So perhaps that's something that people can consider looking at some of these mobile apps that yeah. you can download to help. And I mentioned, I mentioned Headspace and Calm, but um, they do have a free trial, but they have generally a monthly payment that you need to do. So another one that I've been mentioning at the moment that I've recently found is called Balance. And that is one that is giving a free year. I mean, you have to, you, you can give a donation, but ultimately you could give that a go for a year um, and see um, how you get on with that if, if it's not something you want to be um, paying for at the moment. And someone else has just suggested another one in the chat. Priz. Priz. Yeah. Um, but what I would say about balance is make sure that you know that in a year they'll start charging you. So just remember to um, cancel it, put something in your diary if you don't want to. The other thing that there is on the MPN Voice website is that there have been a series of podcasts put on there. So yeah. we've seen that quite a lot of people have downloaded them and I'm sure Brilliant. lots of people are going to come and download your presentation <laughs> as well, which is absolutely <laughs> fantastic. Good. Thanks. Okay. Um, we've had a few questions come in about um, how to access free lateral flow um, tests once kind of the um, free supply ends at the beginning of April. Um, I know there was a recent announcement um, by Savage Javid, who um, at the end of last week, I think about being um, for the lateral flows to still be available for vulnerable people free of charge after April. And I think a lot of charities are um, moving forward with this to try and find out how that will be made available to patients. So I think at the moment we just um, 
perhaps need to just be aware of what the charities are doing in trying to secure how patients will be able to access. But the initial communications have been that they will still be available free of charge for vulnerable people. Um, let's move on. Um, so well, I can see Maz has put the, the links to the podcasts in the chat. I love the fact that this is so interactive. It's really good, isn't it? <laughs> yeah, nice. So please do keep your comments and questions coming in. That's really good. Um, I can see a question in the chat while we're looking at the list of your pre-submitted ones about, <clears throat> and so maybe we can all chat about this. It's from David S., how can I tell myself it's safe to do things that for two years I've been told are unsafe? So this is touching on a bit about finding out what's, um, where you're comfortable, such as touching metal surfaces, going to the gym, being close to others. I try to tell myself it's different now, but I still worry every single time I go out and touch surfaces. So what I would say is, <clears throat> in general, we do not believe that COVID infection is transmitted by touching door handles. I know I've spent two years being really paranoid about door handles and doing really bizarre things with my sleeve <laughs> and poking <laughs> the open the door button on the train with something other Running. than my <laughs> finger. <clears throat> but actually, this is a disease that is transmitted by droplets. So um, I know that you've been worried about touching metal things and George is going to comment on that at some point. But I think it's important to also understand the science here. Yeah, um, something, because I'm exactly the same as you and something that I found quite helpful was um, I got an email from um, TFL about the tubes and they were saying that they've not found any traces of COVID on any of the handles or um, or seats or anything, which is quite interesting. Um, but again, it's back to doing kind of what makes you feel comfortable. So if it does make you feel comfortable to make sure you're wiping down equipment in the gym, do it. If it um, helps you get back to doing something that's important to you, then I would say that that's a kind of worthwhile trade-off. Um, it might be that you still want to be a bit cautious about washing your hands, or maybe you do want to just take a bit of hand sanitizer with you. Um, I would be conscious about um, how much time we put into those things, but ultimately what I would kind of say is if it means that you're able to do more of the things that matter to you and you're able to get back out and do um, more things, if you have a little hand sanitizer with you, then that feels appropriate. Um, but it is really difficult. We have, we, we've given completely different information now than we did at the beginning. And it's hard to forget how anxious we were at the beginning, wiping down things that you brought into the house and um, having letters in quarantine outside until we brought them in, all those strange things that we had to do. So um, I'd also just say, be a bit kind to yourself and know that it's a process and that you're not going to immediately um, turn a switch and feel feel back to how you were before um actually some of this is important I mean yeah. my boys go to a gym <laughs> and actually they are sweaty hot places yeah. and people do sweat on yeah. gym equipment so perhaps it's a healthy thing to yeah. actually yeah. wipe it down it's just about yeah. where is the healthy and being yeah. and knowing that if you wipe it down you feel comfortable isn't yeah. it and just noticing when that starts to get a little out of hand as well, I would say. Um, yes. Because there's nothing wrong with washing your hands and being clean. But if it starts to become something that's really interfering with your day-to-day -day life, that would be when it started to become a problem. But yeah, generally, you know, I'd like more people to wash their hands more. <laughs> yes. Or doing it for longer than singing happy birthday twice. Yes. Remember that? <laughs> yes. Yeah, I remember all of that. Okay. Um, I have a question here for you, Claire. Um, it talks about... Um, that recently we've heard that um, unfortunately some of the patients who have had poor outcomes with COVID um, have been um, a relatively high proportion of them have been blood cancer patients um, and the question is do we know what proportion of those had MPNs? Yeah I've seen that information and I've seen it um, talked about so um, the bottom line is we do not know all of that information. Um, what I can tell you is at the present time of the 60 to 70 patients we have who are inpatients at Guy's and St Thomas's, none of them are any of our MPN patients. And I can also tell you that I know of only one or two of our patients across the country who are currently in hospital with MPN. Um, I think that, um, 
at the beginning of the pandemic, people whose immune systems are suppressed, and there is some evidence that MPN patients' immune systems are suppressed, did suffer more. And that's why we put a lot of effort into vaccination and prioritizing vaccinations, et cetera. Um, I don't think that there is currently any evidence that I am aware of that that is still the case. It doesn't mean that you shouldn't have your vaccine. It doesn't mean that you shouldn't call the COVID medicines unit if you have a positive lateral flow. And that's why we thought this was a really good topic to kick off and have locally and share with the wider community. Um, but I am not aware of that. And certainly we haven't seen that in our patients locally. And I think that's probably all the information that we can give. And I don't know whether, Georgie, you want to maybe reflect on kind of handling that information. And, and when you see that kind of information out in the media and how not to try to try and yeah. take notice of it, but not to zoom into it too much. Um, my advice would always just be about thinking about your sources. Um, so if you do have any concerns, make sure you do speak to your medical team, um, that you are able to check any of these things. And ultimately, we're all going off the best advice we have at the time, aren't we? Um, so there are no clear cut answers. There's no um, clear right or wrong, um, but just generally making sure that you're talking about your concerns with your medical team, I would suggest. So we've had another question come in about should we all have the fourth vaccine and how do we access it? Um, so yes, all patients are eligible to have their fourth vaccine. So their booster dose after three months after their third dose. Um, now, um, I, I think a lot of patients have found that um, they've been able to do this with a letter from their um, treating um, hospital team. I know certainly a lot of GPs have referred some of our patients to us and we've provided with a with a letter that's really just stating as per the current guidelines you're a, able to have your that your booster dose three months post your third dose. Um, and certainly I think it's been a case of taking letters to walk-in centres or if your GPs are providing the vaccines is then showing that letter um, to your GP um, to say that you're eligible to receive it. And I know certainly we've done a lot of letters for our patients to, to that effect really, and they've all been able to access their vaccines with the letters. I think also probably if you had a shielding letter, and by the way, distribution of letters from the government, very patchy. So. <laughs> you know, shielding letters, COVID testing letters, blah, blah, blah. But if you happen to be somebody who has had one of those, you could probably also take that and that would probably um, make you eligible. And that we've also had other people who've walked into a vaccine hub and just spoken to them about that. And as I said, don't worry about what type of vaccine, Pfizer or Moderna, all fine. And no evidence that any particular combination of vaccines is better than another one. Can you forgive me whilst I try and read through some of the questions. There was a question about panoramic, which I answered through the Q&A. So <clears throat> the question was, um, Perhaps I didn't make panoramic trial quite clear. So if you are an ET or a PV patient and you're not on a treatment, and I know that some people have unfortunately had a lot of difficulty getting access to COVID medicines units, um, but I did try to show you how busy they are. We woke up on Boxing Day to 280 referrals in the box at GSTT. Um, you may still be eligible for panoramic, even if you're under 50, so 50 just happens to be an age cut off, but uh, it's still worth um, thinking about registering for the study. And what happens is you fill in a thing online and then a study doctor will call you and speak to you. So you could explain that you've got this blood condition, explain that you were classed as clinically extremely vulnerable. So hopefully that's helpful. Claire, did you find a question? I've got a question for you, Claire. Um, <laughs> in the event of catching COVID, would taking antivirals result in less natural immunity against future possibly more virulent vi variants than riding it out, assuming it's a mild infection? 
Well, that's a really good question, isn't mm. it, actually? Um, and I think that's probably a personal decision. And it might be based a bit on how fit you are, how much you think your immunity is suppressed and how unwell you feel with COVID. And ultimately, you're going to take a personal decision. You would take a personal decision about vaccination or not. Unfortunately, healthcare workers can now take a personal decision about that as well. Um, so, but what about scientific evidence? So actually... Uh, unfortunately, disappointingly, probably the answer is there is none. <clears throat> you will still mount an immune response, though, to the virus, even if you take those medicines. And I showed you that lovely series of negative lateral flow tests in that patient. But um, that patient happened to actually have very high antibody levels anyway, but still caught the virus. So I think you just have to decide for yourself. And there's there is no clear evidence and the studies where those drugs were tested, they were tested in unvaccinated patients. So that's why we're doing panoramic and that's why we're kind of collecting data. So take a decision yourself, but know that you can only be eligible for these treatments if you're within five days. And I think that's some of the other questions that have come in have been around difficulties in um, contacting and um, being assessed by the CMDUs. Um, and about being told they're non, not eligible to receive this treatment. And I think as Claire said in her, in her talk, is perhaps it's to, you know, I certainly, when I'm telling patients to ring one one, will tell them to keep it to the, I have a blood cancer, I'm on treatment, please can you refer me on to the CMDU? Um, but it, it looks like some of your questions that some of you uh, have found, unfortunately, had to go through a number of different phone calls in order to be able to access the treatments. Actually, there was somebody, um, was it yesterday? I've forgotten all the days blur into one. That's the <laughs> yeah. other problem with the past two years, isn't it? Although last week there was a patient, mm. a local patient that we said, no, bring them up. And she spoke to 111 and 111 said, you're not eligible, but bless 111, they have thousands of calls so mm. what we actually said was ring again yeah. <laughs> and when she rang again they said yes mm. fine so your local team can refer but the quickest way is actually to ring 111 mm -hmm. and just keep the information simple and straightforward we got any more questions i've seen something in the chat <clears throat> and i know maz is online and um, huge thanks to Maz for everything she does for MPN Voice and all the comms. So MPN Voice put a letter out um, about third doses of vaccines and wondering about whether it might be helpful to put a letter out that people can download about fourth doses. So Maz, I know you're listening in. Maybe we should just doctor, in inverted commas, what we've already got there and put a fourth one on and people can just download it and hopefully you found those helpful oh, yeah no i think i think that would be a good idea she says okay we'll do <laughs> thumbs up <clears throat> um I, I, this is a question that probably you might be able to help with georgia again um what advice can you give to partners and families of people with mpns in particular those with MF, if the partners are fully jabbed, not immune compromised and wish to get back to normal, um, for example, exercises, sharing holiday homes with others and mm. going out. Right, so is that about the family members wanting to get back to normal? Yes. Again, you know, I'm sure you're probably sick of, of this answer, but I think it is just a personal decision. You know, I don't think in these situations there's a clear right or wrong um, I think it is about taking your family's personal um, situation into account, having open conversations with your loved ones about what you think um, you would find helpful, what they would find helpful and seeing if you can come to a middle ground. But again, there's no risk free option. There's no um, perfect answer here. Unfortunately, I wish there was. Um, but yeah, just, and again, just making sure that you're communicating with with each other, something that I come up against all the time in therapy with patients is them saying to me, um, oh, well, I don't want to burden anybody else. Um, so I keep it to myself, putting on this brave face for everyone else and saying, oh, you know, I'm fine, I don't mind, when that's 
the opposite. Um, so I really would always say, make sure that you are um, trying to communicate how you feel. You do try and let that brave face mask slip down every now and again. Um, because ultimately the, the problem with putting on a brave face and pretending everything's fine when it's not quite how you're feeling is that you feel very isolated. It feels like nobody else understands. Um, and they're never going to understand unless we, we tell them, unfortunately. So again, personal decision based on your current situation, trying to have that open communication where you can share your, your fears and concerns and your hopes for what will um, happen and go from there. But it might be trial and error. You know, none of these things are set in stone. Any decision that you make in terms of um, going out and getting back to normal in inverted commas, you might try and go, oh, that was a bit much actually. Maybe I'll try something different this time. Or maybe you'll say, maybe I can do a little bit more next time. So just knowing that you can be quite flexible with these boundaries as well. Thank you. Um, we've had a question about what is the best kind of mask to wear when in crowded indoor venues? Um, and I suppose that's a little bit difficult to answer in that what is the best mask? Um, you know, certainly even in a hospital environment, we have different masks for different situations. Yeah. I suppose some of it is looking at what is the best mask or what is the most comfortable mask that you're wearing um, and wearing a mask, really. I don't know if any of the other guests would like to comment. I think one thing is, so this is one, I'll go back to what I talked to my young adults in my house about. Actually, the mask you wear it needs to be a clean mask. There's no point having a mask that's in your pocket that's crumpled up, that's been there for weeks and weeks and weeks. <clears throat> Uni students like to save money, so I'm like, don't worry, I'll send you as many masks as you want. But so a mask that's comfortable, if you wear glasses for a mask that doesn't steam up your glasses, I mean, there are FFP3 masks which have got the valves on them that fit your face more closely, and they're definitely something we would use in a COVID ward in the hospital, mm. and we would wear a visor, etc. But those masks are actually really uncomfortable to wear. And so if you find them comfortable and you want to wear them, by all means wear them. But um, a face mask, a simple surgical face mask or a fabric one, we have to think about the environment as well, don't we? Is, pr is probably good enough and actually, to some extent, it's what other people are wearing as well, rather than what you're wearing. That was a great question. Thank you for that. And thanks for all your comments. Mm -hmm. Keep them coming. So we've also had a question in the chat about what's the difference between so-called primary dose vaccination and a booster? And can you tell which you have been <laughs> offered? So the primary dose vaccinations for our patients were the, so for our for the patients, the primary vaccinations are the dose one, two, and three. Um, for somebody like myself, my primary vaccinations was dose one and two, and then I had my booster. Um, for our patients, the primary, because we um, you were offered the third dose and the third vaccine, that forms part of the primary vaccination. So that forms part of your one, two, and then three. So your fourth dose is your booster dose, that is given the three months after your third dose. Now, um, to begin with, there was um, difficulties with how that was registered on the NHS apps and things. And I think a lot of the third doses went down as booster doses. Um, I myself haven't been on the app recently to know whether they've actually changed now, um, but certainly they were looking at getting them recorded so that the fourth dose or the booster dose after you've had three primary vaccinations could also be recorded. So we'd just say that initially when the third doses were being mm. given, uh, MPN Voice and Blood Cancer UK and several other blood cancer charities put out a strong message that actually it was important to have a Pfizer jab as your third primary because of the quantity of dose in the vaccine. So technically that was a difference, but actually that, again, that was one of the myths, the great COVID myths, actually it doesn't really matter. Um, and who knows for the future ones, they may well be um, 
um, uh, engineered against Omicron. I'm just smiling because I can see David's put a, in the chat. I've been given two primary and one booster. I guess I'll just get another booster. That's the spirit. Mm -hmm. It's just boosting your immunity. I think it is the technicality and the and the kind of confusion about certain language and i think it's also important to say that if, for those of you that had the pfizer vaccines the dose was the same throughout so the dose for dose one two three and a booster was the same dose mm -hmm. um there's a question that's come in about is there any evidence of any of the mpn treatments being protective from covid answer that one Claire. yeah so um I think having your MPN well controlled and being as healthy as possible. So if you think about that in the broadest sense of MPN treatment, that is important and it will it will help you get less severe COVID. It won't protect you from getting it. There's other things that protect you from getting it. And ultimately it's a bit, it's chance. I thought I was invincible till Chinese New Year, for example. So those things are important. And we know that so much that, you know, still, in general, it's people who are less healthy, etc. And for the vast majority of people who are in hospital are not vaccinated still, I would say. Um, so um, they will protect you to some extent. We have investigated JAK inhibitors such as ruxolitinib, not fedratinib so as such, but ruxolitinib has been investigated as a treatment for COVID. Um, in the trial, it was probably used at slightly too lower dose. And interestingly, other related JAK inhibitors, so baricitinib, for example, is now being used. One thing I would say, really important about ruxolitinib, if you have COVID, do not stop your drug. CMDU might suggest that you lower the dose a bit. And if you're not sure about that, contact your hospital team. But don't stop it because you'll get a, bound, a rebound of inflammation, which can make COVID worse. So most treatments probably don't um, protect you. There has been some discussion about interferon because interferon is an antivirus drug and it was originally used to treat hepatitis. So it does work as an antiviral, it does turn up the immune system, and some countries have used interferon alpha, and we had a trial using inhaled interferon to treat COVID. So that, that has been sexy, but there's no clear evidence. And it's very difficult to interpret the literature because often younger patients might have interferon um, and patients who don't have more severe advanced disease might have it. So it makes it a bit biased when we're looking at the data. So hopefully that's answered that question. So I'm loving the fact that there are still questions coming into the chat. Um, <clears throat> And thank you to David for looking at the app that, that shows that the third dose is still registered as a booster. Um, and I think where we were booking vaccines on the app for our one, two and third or booster, um, I think the fourth doses, and certainly in my experience with a lot of patients, have mostly been through walk-in centres with a letter that tells you. Um, I don't think you, can, you can't actually book a lot of the fourth doses on the app because it registers that you've already had three. Um, so it has been a lot through walk-in centres with the evidence to say that you're eligible to have your booster. So a question in the, that's been submitted, and I think we're going to get ready to wrap up soon, probably, because we've had some really great interaction and great questions. And sorry, but we've been focusing this um, session really on COVID um, rather than other questions. Um, one is, is the problem with COVID linked to progression of MPN or is it the COVID itself? Claire, do you want to comment on that? So maybe we could rephrase that as, does COVID make your MPN progress? Okay, so, I mean, in my experience, no. Um, it, it's not a cause for your MPN changing. Um, you know, unfortunately, patients 
are unwell with or can be unwell with COVID and symptoms will vary between patients. We're, um, but certainly as in it causing the MPN to change or to alter, then no, not necessarily. You know, we might see some blood results at the time of an infection being slightly different to what your normal range will be um, because we know bloods can change with infection, um, but once infections are resolved, then normally those bloods will go back to your baseline levels for you. Add anything to that? Yeah, I think I think that's fine. And the rest of the question was about impacts of COVID on younger patients with asymptomatic MPN. So, in general, what is true for the general population is that older people have suffered more with COVID, and that's why we were, you know, looking after people in care homes and very, and much older people. But it doesn't mean that if you're young, you're immune to it. Um, so um, that's important as well. So hopefully, hopefully we've answered that question. But I think we need to feel really hopeful now. We need to feel positive. Lots of things that we can do. We've got testing, we've got treatments, we've got vaccination. And so um, this is what we really wanted to focus on today. So Claire, any other comments from you? Well, I'd just like to say thank you for those of you that have joined us this evening. And I do hope that you have um, felt that it has helped and have um, taken away some good information from the sessions. I would also like to thank all of you, those that did um, submit some questions. And I'm sorry, we haven't covered all of your questions that you've submitted today. Um, but certainly, you know, if you are having questions, then please do speak with your local teams or your local nurses to discuss the questions that you've raised. Um, and certainly, you know, as I said at the beginning, if any of you are from um, the Southeast region and would like to join the GSTT support group at any of our further sessions, then please do let us know and we will certainly send you the links. Um, there, the next one is scheduled to occur in May. No, sorry, hold on, let me count my months. Two months from today, March. Yeah, no, May, <laughs> it is May, sorry, long day. <laughs> so thank you, Claire, for setting up this and thank you for everything you do. International Women's Day, yes. and and isn't it International Nurses Day? Or it's a celebration National of Cancer. National Cancer mm. Nurses Day. So watch out for that, and please message and thank your cancer nurses. So thank your CNSs who look after you with your MPN. Uh, no, no. I maybe would echo maybe. that, Claire. I would echo that, and I think. You know, thank you for, um, on behalf of MPN Voice, thank you for this new initiative. It's been the most amazing um, webinar and full of useful information from Georgia. Um, I'm delighted that it's going to be going up on YouTube. So anybody who wants to see these talks and Q and A's again, will be able to see the webinar on YouTube. Uh, the other thing, in case there's anybody who hasn't been to any of these events uh, before, um, always check in with our website, mpnvoice.org.uk. It's full of useful information and it's always up to date. Together with checking in on Health Unlocked, uh, we have Twitter, we have Facebook. Uh, it's a growing community, which has just been fabulous, but this is such a really, really good new initiative. Um, and I think will be enjoyed by so many people. But, you know, MPN Voice couldn't do this without your support. Um, and we do need donations because um, putting these events on always does cost money. Um, you can donate. We'd be really grateful, even if it's a couple of quid or whatever you can afford. Um, if you can either use the QR code below um, or go through Just Giving. Um, and if you've got any queries, Maz will answer those, info at mpnvoice.org.uk. Um, but I think, you know, we, we, we're a growing community and sadly to say we do need the funds to support that community. But uh, could I have the next slide, please, Claire? But on behalf of all of us, I'd like to say a huge, huge thank you to everyone in the community for all your ongoing support. And Georgia, particularly to you, 
um, because I think this is the first webinar you've done for us and it's just it been phenomenally helpful um, and I'm sure so many people will get the bucket and <laughs> visualize the bucket um, and I, I just think it's it's been fantastic um, you know all of you give up your time to um, help support this webinar and I have to say it really is a pre I genuinely appreciated by all of the patients everywhere we are so lucky as MPN patients to get the help and advice, support and fun too, actually, within the community. And there's, you know, one person who started all that, and that's you, Claire. Um, and I no, think it was a team. Right. <laughs> a team led by you. <laughs> there's no I in team. <laughs> okay, okay. Um, but anyway, we, we really do appreciate it and look forward to seeing you all again very soon. One final thing, we would really appreciate it if you could do those feedback forms, because it does help us formulate a plan for where we go from here. To all of you, stay well and keep safe. And thank you for attending this MPN Voice um, for, well, it's not a forum webinar from the guys in St. Thomas's support team. Thank you very much to all of you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And thanks to everyone in the room here that's made it happen. Absolutely. Danny, Drew, and Dean. <laughs> Take care, everyone. Bye. Bye. Good night. Bye.